are thrilled to welcome powerhouse filmmaker Andy Timoner. <laughs> Hello. First of all, congratulations on getting out of bed after yesterday. Can you believe yesterday? I mean, just day one. It was like 10 days in one. Um, welcome to uh, the first ever We Talk Sundance edition. Um, we, I actually thought of it on this stage talking about my career last year and on a women in film panel. And I thought, with Me Too and Time's Up happening, um, what about we do? What about all the women that are doing incredible work in the world and shaping our culture? Um, what if we did a traveling talk show event where we brought women together that are extraordinary to talk about their work? Because no, women know how to talk. That's one thing that we do know how to do. So, uh, so welcome to We Talk, and thank you to Dell. We're so honored to be at the Dell Den. They've been our partners since we launched the show at uh, South by Southwest this past year. And also I want to thank our partners at Majority, at Interloper Films, at Tom Pearson Associates. Um, and without further ado, I want to bring up my esteemed guests, Geraldine Dreyfus and Jesse Dieter. Um, yeah. So our first panel is going to be uh, about documentaries. I don't know anything about them. This is called Exposing the Truth, um, and it's sort of looking below the surface. And uh, Geraldine actually produced The Great Hack, which is premiering tonight, um, about Cambridge Analytica and our data being compromised. Yeah. She's also the founder of Impact Partners, uh, co-founder of Impact Partners, which has enabled so many films to come into existence that are part of our, of the fabric of our lives at this point and have like influenced our culture in massive ways. Also the founder of the Utah Film Center. I call her Glenda the Good Witch. Um, I think she's generally uh, blessed us all as documentary filmmakers and so it's so great and she's a great friend. So it's so uh, it's an honor to have you on the show, finally. Thank you, Andy. Yeah. And Jesse Dieter, um, man, I'm going to have to go because there's so many credits. Jesse Dieter is the producer of The Inventor, Out for Blood in Silicon Valley. I don't know if have, have any of you seen that yet. Yeah. That premiered here <laughs> yesterday, two days ago. Two days ago. Night. Opening night. Thir opening night. Opening it's night. Alex Way to go. New film. Thank you. Yeah, go Alex girl. Gibney's <laughs> new film. Um, and I want to talk to you all about it, but... Uh, some espionage and some fraud in Silicon Valley. Um, and, shocking. Uh, shocking. <laughs> for Alex. Um, and Jesse's <laughs> also known for uh, producing Do You Trust This Computer, which was released worldwide by Elon Musk for free in, in April of 2018. Directed by Chris Payne, who also directed and you produced Revenge of the Electric Car. Oh, who, who killed, killed the Electric, electric Car yes. and then the Revenge of the Electric exactly. Car. Exactly. Yeah, there was a revenge. <laughs> it did happen. In that order. Not and even Italian. Also done Steve Jobs, The Man <laughs> on the Machine, and then directed and produced uh, the Re a Revolution in Four Seasons, Spark, A Burning Man Story, and Death by Fire. So why don't we just start by talking to you about The Inventor for a second. How did you even come across this extraordinary story of, uh, is her name Elizabeth Holmes? Elizabeth Holmes. Elizabeth Holmes, the woman, the myth. Yeah, no. Yeah, and she's, well, she's like the Steve Jobs kind of like, she was. She, she very, was. yeah, she very self-consciously at the time, she won't own it now, but she definitely modeled herself. Steve Jobs was the model, I mean, to the turtleneck, to the, to the um, she had kind of a way of living that was very stringent, very strict. She only drank this green juice that type of thing, but but we didn't, I can't say we broke the story, because John Carew and his excellent reporting in the Wall Street Journal initially broke the story, but what's tricky for us is that, um, you know, and that's, it's kind of a quintessentially, for those of you who knows Alex Gibney, it's a quintessentially Alex Gibney story, but actually it was two years ago at Sundance when I was here and I ran into Alex literally on the street, and this is kind of one of the great things about Sundance, Sundance you moment. guys know. It was a total Sundance moment. What are you up to shooting the shit? And he says, oh, well, I, we might do this story about Theranos. So I was like, holy Christ, if you do that story, I must produce that story with you because it's a Silicon Valley story. And I know people actually who were some of the early whistleblowers, you know, who, who we didn't actually end up even using those guys in the film because we get uh, we got better guys and we got better footage. So, so, so to sort of fill you in, uh, if you haven't seen this film, um, Elizabeth Holmes swept Silicon Valley, and you know, uh, 
if you look at the early startup days where everybody just had an idea and it would get funded with millions of dollars, that kind of settled a little bit, we thought, and everybody got a little more conservative and responsible with their investments. But she somehow managed to raise $9 billion for her blood testing device. She was that, valued at $9 billion. Valued. She raises $700 million. yes. $700 million. Okay, still. A shit ton of money. Yeah, a lot of money. A ton of money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that, and nobody had seen the actual product, right? Like she had, she Correct. hid it under like a veil of mystery. That's right, and not even Walgreens. No, but she, she did this amazing job. And again, and I actually had women who were former employees who refused to talk to me on or off of the record because they said, I'm not gonna talk to you because it's letting down the team and the cause of women to talk to you about the story. And I was like, are you kidding me? If we can't be accountable as anybody else, then what is the point of us, if we're gonna do great things, they have to actually be great, right? That's one thing I was going to ask you is about women. You know, it's, it, it's this time where everyone is looking to support women, at least to appear to support women, right? Um, and, and everybody seemed so excited to support her, right? Do you think that her gender had something to do with being able to pull this off? Absolutely. Like in the film, we, we have a, a woman. So the women in the story were not really t as taken in to the extent, interestingly, as the old white males were. And she says they succumbed to a certain charm, which they did. I think everybody wanted to. I wanted to believe the story. It was very personal to me because it was this wonderful myth. You know, she called herself the unicorn. She, she, it was this creation story she had. She drops out of Stanford. She does this amazing thing. She's going to test years old. I too, I hate blood tests, right? So the idea that you could take, you could do a finger prick of blood and it, you can go to Walgreens, shop, do your blood test, come out with your results. Like who wouldn't want that? Yeah, and something like 46% of people would rather have a robotic or AI doctor than a regular doctor at this point. You know, I think people have more faith at this point in technology. I find that shocking. Yeah. That's how true. many people here want a robot or a doctor? How, how many people <laughs> want robotic doctors? <laughs> I don't think I don't trust that data. <laughs> well, we were on the stage yesterday. I'm just saying. I think you probably know that's that. actually true. Okay. I'll challenge According you. According to who? I'll show you. Okay, great. <laughs> I'll show you the stat. It's, uh, it's actually something I had uh, in my back pocket for my Wall Street Journal interview yesterday. There you go. Yeah, I didn't use Heard it, it here so I used it now. On WeTalk. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, Gerilyn, Gerilyn, Gerilyn. Yes, darling. Meanwhile, as, as, as she's defrauding Silicon Valley, as Elizabeth Holmes is doing that, Cambridge Analytica is uh, looking at how they can manipulate, uh, based on big data, how they can manipulate our vote. Tell us exactly. about the great hack and, uh, and how you knew this was an incredible story that had to be told and how you went about it. So this story started out, um, I produced uh, The Square with Jahan uh, Nujam and Kareem Amir, and it was the first Netflix original, and it was nominated for an Academy Award, and right after the um, Academy Awards, Netflix said, we want to fund your next film. Come back to us with an idea. So Kar Kareem and Jahan went back with the Sony hack, and we thought the Sony hack was a physical hack. So we were trying to understand cyber war and hacks. And then we pivoted from, so we weren't as smart as she was. We didn't have as many, uh, all her research under her belt. We were starting fresh and we were literal. That's harder. So, so that. we went from the Sony hack to Guccifer, to the DNC hack, to Cambridge Analytica, stopped there, went down a rabbit hole, came back up, looked at Facebook, and then tried to see how these were all connected. And it turns out, we're getting very close to proving that Guccifer, DNC hack, Cambridge Analytica, and Facebook are all connected. Um, so it is, um, it's really looking at the disruption of when um, cyber optics meets ad technology and how we can be micro-targeted with such precision. And the, the biggest part of the film for me is that it really exposes what apathy, like I don't care about my data, I don't have anything to hide. I want the convenience. How apathy can um, converge with, with this egotistical idea that we have that we're not persuadable. Because the micro-targeting is about that percentage of voters that's actually persuadable. And you know, like me, I'm like, I'm not persuadable. I read. I'm open to you know, new ideas. Well, the fact is, we don't even know what we're being fed in our algorithm. We have no idea what we're being fed in our algorithms. It's the illusion of autonomy. Exactly. That is, is so prevalent today. We actually really believe that we're making free choices, but we're being fed all these presets and 
uh, all of this is big data has become the most valuable asset on it's Earth. More, it's more valuable than oil right now. It's just, it is the most valuable. And, and in the hands of, like we've always been worried, we grew up on the 1984 nation state, what happens with big government. That's happening in Russia and China and Saudi Arabia and Iran. But here we have you know, corporations that are bigger than our nation state, that are more powerful. And we have regulated, we have a, a governing body that doesn't know how to regulate the space, doesn't even understand the space. So it's a very confusing time. But as, as well, the government, private companies like Amazon are selling their face, you know, the facial recognition software to the government, which then can be used to suppress us if we, you know, yeah. if it comes to that. Yeah. Um, it, so what are we giving up when we touch the keyboard, Gerilyn? And what do we need to do to protect ourselves? Um, you know, the, your digital foot, footprint, your fingerprint is basically now a public asset, right? So it's the, what was uniquely your own in your imprint is now a public asset, and it's being traded and sold <laughs> at multiples, and it, it, the volume of which it's being traded and sold, we don't even have a handle on. You might understand that more. But well, I did do your test this computer, so you're yeah. speaking the language. Yeah, so yeah, we did chime the in. Story. Chi I mean, yeah, chime no, I want, in. On I want to ask you about do you trust this computer, because I was blown away by yeah. it. Yeah. Um, it was really terrifying, and AI is, you know, and we were here talking about near-future dystopia just yesterday, and the idea of, uh, you know, our autonomy, the HAL 9000 moment for mankind, according to Josh Harris, the subject of We Live in Public, is 2025. Um, so that's in six years that to, before we are taken over by the algorithm and no longer autonomous. Um, where, where, where were you with this film and AI and... Well, I'm curious, again, Gerald, I'm super, I haven't seen your film yet, obviously, but I'm dying to know your take on, because, because for Do You Trust This Computer, we really ended up with two, it was really interesting, there were very, two very distinct strands of thought, and one is absolutely Elon's fear factor, but again, he ends up, where he ends up is, we should join the Borg literally in order to beat it, or be absorbed by it. And the other side is, is the futurist side, right? So you have guys like Kevin Kelly who said, you know, I embrace this data. He said, basically, yes, everybody is, co is collecting your data all of the time, as you very well know. But we just need to be more informed consumers and more considerate. And we need to know, we need to have a, a share and a voice in the horse yeah. trade that's happening, right? We train the AI with our behavior. Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but we because need to get we can something make kind back. and responsible AI. Yeah, and we need to influence. We just companies have to be to kind think. and responsible human beings. Right, and we need yeah. to fund. <laughs> I mean, Megan Smith was here yesterday. Who was America's first CTO and was actually on this show at South by. Um, and she was saying, you know, we we give a certain amount of school lunches, and then when it goes to summer, we can't find those kids that need lunch because nobody's funding that, and that's so easy that algorithm because that algorithm's not as sexy or or you know is not going to get the profit of a self-driving car, which gets all the funding. So how do we influence it? You're right in the center of Silicon Valley, you know, and in the center of all of these films. So. What do we do? How do we get these big behemoth companies to start thinking about social responsibility and like how can their apps or their hardware get us offline also to save us from being subsumed by the machine? I mean, the trick is, and, I, and to correct me if I'm wrong, in our reporting, the trick is really what, exactly what you're saying, that the government is so far behind in terms of regulating. They don't even know, even in the field, they don't even know what the hell to regulate or how to regulate. So therefore, we're unfortunately in this really interesting position where we're kind of requiring the people in the space and doing the business and the big companies to self-regulate because, and that's why they have these, you know, open AIs and stuff because the movers and the thinkers are having to do it as private individuals and, and private corporations. And so the more we can sensitize people people to kind of demanding it, it's not going to come fast enough from the government, as far as I can tell. There is no yeah. government regulation. Well, it, it, there's no answer for it. I mean, that's the problem. There, 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 I mean, the regulation that we didn't have any regulation over our elections, so all 220 million American voters were shipped, you know, via cyberspace to Scotland and processed by Cambridge Analytica, and every single voter had 5,000 data points, and they were targeting people in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin to win the Electoral College, and they did that very effectively, but they also were targeting people to suppress their vote by testing messages like Crooked Hillary and The Wall and, you know, um, 
drain the swamp. And they started that in 2014. So they had 10,000 different uh, commercial messages for, per persuadable um, voter. And that's not an exaggeration. That 10,000, if, they, if you, they, they saw that you liked red ties better than yellow ones, Trump was wearing a yellow tie, I mean, red tie. I mean, it was, it could all be photo, it was all done in real time. Not based on someone deciding, based on the data that was consumed on the profile of the social media platform of that voter. So they just switched it automatically. Nobody had to tell them to do it. So um, You produced Icarus as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't. That, that I actually partners. personally didn't. That Dan Kogan did. I, I mean, I was a, I was right, a your cheerleader on the side of that film. But Impact was, Partners. Impact Partners did, absolutely. Enabled that film into being. How did the two relate? Well, Russia. I mean, the, the sort of... Uh, uh, there's that. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, Putin... I mean, there's two very important points here. So the, the, the kind of double speak that you see in Icarus and the masterminding of just, the, just complete deniability on behalf of the Russians and what they get away with was just a pregame warm-up for what we're seeing right now. And in fact, we had the State Department... Um, tell us that there were three things that happened to Putin that made him attack Hillary Clinton. One was um, the, the, he was embarrassed by um, the Panama Papers. He thought that was the CIA. He was embarrassed that he was outed by Hillary Clinton to, for interfering in the British elections. And then he also thought that the CIA um, basically exposed the doping scandal. So he went after, he was attacking her for the McGinsky Act and that, but it, with a nail on the coffin was Icarus. But it wasn't, what he doesn't understand is the power of independent filmmaking. It wasn't the press, because they didn't know the story. We broke that story and brought it to the New York Times, and it wasn't the State Department, it wasn't Hillary Clinton. I mean, we've had senators say, I wish we were smart enough to have been the people that did the Panama Papers and the Icarus thing. They weren't. And so that's what we have to depend on is people like this you in the is, audience. This is so important, what you're saying, because it, the, you know the news, cycle and we all know that how how rough it's gotten to know what's what we can believe and what we can't believe anymore um but it also it's fleeting it's a cycle and it repeats you know doc filmmakers and i want to i don't want this panel to end without asking you about impact partners and, and the genesis of that and the unique model that it is because it has and like throw out some titles because it, it, what documentary filmmakers do and have the power to do, and I learned this when I first picked up a camera and went into prisons in Connecticut when I was 19, is get the story, get in there, and stay in there, and one interview leads to five more, leads to 10 more, and then the next thing you know, you're putting the case together for the attorneys or the government or or the New York Times. Evidentiary truth. The camera, just, can, you can show people what it, exactly what it looks like. Exactly. So tell, tell, tell me how that started. How did, tell us how Impact Partners started, please. So we're 13 years old, and um, I was, uh, my first film was a film called The Day My God Died, and then Born Into Brothels. And after we won the Academy Award for Born Into Brothels, we had a lot of our early grant supporters wanting to invest in the next film and the next film. And the next two films were kind of disasters on the money side. And so we had a few of our investors saying that we're really, they're from Silicon Valley, saying this model is broken. The financing doesn't work. The distribution doesn't work. We're going to figure out a, out a different way of doing this. this. This is a field that needs capital to be disciplined, equity to be disciplined. Um, and we need the content faster. So we need the discipline of capital to accelerate it. So we came up with the model of impact. We grew, put together some private investors that were going to put equity in the documentary space. We were an anathema because documentary filmmakers felt like you know, they already mortgaged their house their credit cards, their They're careers, dumb. their children, their, you know, their veterinarian bills, everything because to make their films. And we were just saying, no, if we get you your money faster, the market will respond when, when your content rises you know, uh, uh, above. So that was the concept, was to get capital to great storytellers, and that we, we really see uh, filmmakers as entrepreneurs. Um, they're cultural and creative entrepreneurs and that they need to be able to pivot and they need money and people to support them to allow them to pivot when they need to. So that was and, the idea. And, and the pivoting occurs when you're partway down the track yeah. and suddenly you get an interview or something happens or some information comes in that just flips the script. And that's why it's usually unscripted until the yeah. end. 
And then, Every time. And, I mean, I've been in the edit bay where I'm like done, and then Russell Brand like decides to propose a revolution or something. I'm like, yeah. okay, I guess we're not done. <laughs> Gotta go Every out time. There. Yeah. 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 So, so then what you're saying is that filmmakers come back and dip back into the well. People put more money in. Yeah, it's or well, or they're well just given the freedom to be able to pivot, and so that you know, so that they can they have the resources, or we help them get a legal team. In the case of Icarus, we had huge amounts of legal. In the case of um, the great hack, I mean, the kind of legal advice and protection we needed for our whistleblowers, working with Mueller, working with our you know Senate Judiciary Committee, it's very serious stuff, and we had to be patriots first and turn over inf information to law enforcement and and wait to see if it sort of broken time to be part of our story. And a lot of the stuff we know won't be in this film tomorrow because we're not allowed to talk about it. But we're going to open up the edit again. Netflix has been great about that. We're going to open up the edit again and keep editing. And just like The Square, when Jahana Kareem did the first chapter of The Square, when, the, when Mubarak was added, but the military came back in and took over the regime, they had to open up the edit again. And that story was not over. And it's still not over. And this story isn't over either. It's like the, I mean, it's the proverbial tip of the iceberg, what's happening. And you've got things like Roger Stone <laughs> yesterday being, two days ago, being arrested. I think Steve Bannon will probably be indicted. Um, and, uh, got and that. I was with you in New York when you were running next door to go get that interview. Yeah. And said, how did you, what did you say to get the interview? Well, he thought I was Jahan and, <laughs> and, um, it, he, Gerald and Jahan, but he I mean, loved. You guys look so similar. No, no, no. He's never met her before, but he used to own a media company and he tried to buy the control room. And this is what he said. He said, she's the first person that understood the eco chamber. And he said, it used to be that if you won the war, you got to write history. And then it was, if you control the narrative, you get, you know, like you control the airwaves, you get to write history. But now we've got an eco chamber and we can, we can splinter and divide. And now we don't have to, we don't need the airwaves anymore. We can go direct to brainwaves. That's, that's what he said. And he wanted, he wanted to buy Jahan's movie and she sold it to Magnolia. And so he's like, yeah, that's that's why he met with me. I mean, he, he thought I was Googled Jahan. her along the way. <laughs> no, that was awesome. You were yeah. just like, I'm no, we were just lucky. Up and I'll be right back. <laughs> um, okay, last question as we were to wrap up. But what, speaking of pivoting, what was a pivot for you in the inventor? In the in the self inventor, um, the the pivot for us was we got we got a really again, and you also have happy accidents. You know, I mean, Icarus obviously is kind of a, a great case study of that. <laughs> <laughs> unhappy. I love that film. Um, so we didn't, in the beginning, we really, we had to go back out and re-report um, this story and people were loath to talk. They still thought they were, Theranos was still going because Theranos was still, they later went on to get another $100 million invested in them after that. People had signed NDAs. No, they're like, we're not talking. So we got, we had a couple, we had a story kind of, and we had a couple kind of janky interviews. And then we got a couple people to talk, and then we got to the one source that gave us a treasure trove so that you got to see the film. But you, nobody will not feel as if they didn't see Elizabeth Holmes, and nobody will feel as if they didn't see her. You kind of watch her, you witness her from the inside, and that was like a big gift, and that was a huge pivot in the edit and like changed the entire thing in a good way. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you both for being on We Talk. Um, thank you. Yeah, Jesse Dieter and Geraldine Dreyfus. Thank you.